saying, please find the task correspondence from supervising attorney Boggs. Please let us know if you have any question. Thanks. What did that letter that they attached constitute? Basically it constituted their response to me and what the other party that they went to who refused that freedom of information from me. What they said to them when they went to the refusing party. They, they dated it, Attorney General, blah, blah, blah. The public Access Counselor received a request for review, review concerning the response by whoever I sent it to that refused. To your freedom of information request for copies of various records. And trust me, there was some various records. In the attached April 1st, 2021 email, an assistant attorney general in the public office bureau, they put the name of the one who refused it, confirmed that it withdrew its use of its asserted exemption and provided you with responsive records. Currently, this letter serves to close the matter if you have questions. This part is BS. It was only after it was appealed that they withdrew it. So all the denial, they say, hey, we're exempted from providing you this information. They withdrew it. They talked all that shit. Once it was appealed, now they withdrew it. What I'm showing you here is don't be afraid to appeal your freedom of information. So they might respond, but when they respond, they might issue a freedom of information file number. And when they issue the freedom of information file number, they might refuse it. When they refuse it, you can appeal it. And they will break. Basically, what they're telling the attorney general once his appeal is, hey, oh, yeah, our bad. We withdrew it. We didn't deny him. So let me show you an example of what a Freedom of Information Act suit will look like. By way of a declaratory judgment. And basically getting that statutory damages. Remember, damage is what was done wrong to you. Damage is with an S. It's the civil monetary liability. Declaratory judgments are enforceable based on statute. We know that that which you are enforcing actually has its deeper roots in the Constitution. The vehicle you use to enforce it is the legal aspect, which is the public law equivalent of that statute, which I never do directly mention statute, and if I do, it's always in parentheses just for the sake of simplicity so they can see the quicker reference because that's how their mind works because they always work in a box so what would it look like if they violated that ability for you to receive information because there are fixed algorithms to how they are supposed to do it this is what the complaint will look like now comes plaintiff so and so by her attorney blah 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 the law office they work for they bring the suit for the violation of the Illinois Freedom of Information Act, which we just read at the beginning portion of the video. And in support for her complaint against the village of Dalton, Karen states the following. Pursuant to the fundamental philosophy of American constitutional form of government, it is the public policy of the state of Illinois that all persons are entitled to full and complete information regarding the affairs of government and the official act and policies of those who represents them as public officials and public employee consistent with the terms of, of the Illinois Freedom of Information, blah, blah, blah. And in this specific portion, when it comes to freedom of information, you put the equivalence of your state or the federal level to, if it's a federal agency. In this case, defendant has simply ignored plaintiff FOIA requests pursuant to the policy of noncompliance. Then they list the basic standard of what they're supposed to do. Section 3.5A of the Illinois Freedom of Information Act mandates the following. Upon receiving a request for public record, the Freedom of Information Officer shall 1. Note the date. Complete the day of when the period of response will expire. Maintain an electronic copy of blah, blah, blah. Create a file for it, so and so. But these guys did not, upon receiving plaintiff's request for a public record, note that the date public body received the written request. They did not compute the day on which the Blah, 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 did not make a notation of the data response, did not create file for the retention, the original request, a copy of the response, the record of the written communication with the requester. And do you know how they knew this? They didn't issue a freedom of information number. <laughs> That's how they keep track of it. All these four items, they did not, upon receiving the request, note the data public body received it. They did not compute the date to period of response. They did not make a notation of the date of response, so-and-so. They did not create a file for the retention of the original request, so-and-so. 
That's the all these four attributes are embedded into the freedom of information request number. If you've ever made a freedom of information inquiry, you will know they will issue a, a file number, FOIA number, so and so, to keep track of it. They fail to do that with these people. Let's just say in your circumstance, they've automated the response and the computer generates a freedom of information file number because that's why they have you go to their portal now because that portal what it does is instead of having a human being physically check the email reading it and then issue the file number manually the portal automatically generates it the moment you click send some people have been sued so much like this that they've learned so the odds of this first portion being applicable to yours is quite low but who knows they might not even respond at all to say hey here's your freedom of information number because that will constitute their acknowledgement of it, their file keeping of it. And the day that they give you that file number will be the day to which the expiration period begins to run. You see what's going on. But this second part will be the most applicable. The Act and 5 ILCS, again, will be the equivalence of your states, provides in pertinent parts as follows. Each public body shall promptly either comply with or deny a request for public because within five business days, as we mentioned earlier, after it receipt after its receipt of the request, unless the time for response is properly extended, as we mentioned earlier, blah 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 blah. A public body that fails to respond to a request received may not treat the request as unduly burdensome under subsection G. And then they went into the fact that well they did they did send a freedom of information but they did not request within, but did not respond within five days and then if they were to deny it they're supposed to tell you the reason why they deny it and then they they listed the fact that well they didn't even deny it because they never respond at all they didn't even issue a file number let alone respond and then they give a tabulation and date of the request they made and so on and so forth this is the part that I want you to look at Remember, we're on declaratory action here, and the example is freedom of information. So we've used this opportunity to entertain declaratory action and the source and origin of freedom of information. Because freedom of information is very powerful. I made a patron post regarding where, wherever you're geographically located at, there are certain lists of things you must have in hand preemptively before anything happens. What would your relief look like from declaratory action? or? If you're suing someone under freedom of information equivalence to your state or own federal level, remember on the federal level the response period is actually a bit more than five days. Wherefore, plaintiff, blah blah blah, play the complete 19-minute video for part two is on the Patreon page. Take care. Best of luck.